Welcome to the Texas Heart Institute Educational Programs featuring cardiology in the time of COVID-19 pandemic. The title of today's presentation is Cardiac, Cath Lab, and STEMI in the time of COVID-19. Okay, so today we have uh, uh, with us uh, Dr. Uh, Zvonimir Krajer, who's an interventional cardiologist at the Texas Heart Institute and Program Director of Peripheral Vascular Intervention at THI, um, as well as Clinical Professor of Medicine uh, at the Bayer College of Medicine. And George Yunus, who is an interventional cardiologist at THI and uh, Associate Program Director of our fellowship program, in addition to uh, being the Medical Director of PCI and STEMI services at, at Baylor St. Luke's Medical Center. And my name's Emerson Perrin. I'm the uh, medical director of the Heart Institute and the medical director of the catheterization laboratory at uh, BSLMC. Thank you, Dr. Perrin. <clears throat> what are the disruptive effects of COVID-19 pandemic on the healthcare services? We know that COVID-19 is a new pandemic with enormous impact uh, on healthcare, on the hospitals, many specialties, intensive care units, staff, and equipment. And the cardiac cath lab uh, is certainly not an exception to this particular problem. To improve safety of our patients and staff, we have to reorganize our patient flow. We have to reorganize procedural steps and implement new restrictive measures when and how we perform the procedures. If at all possible, these measures should be implemented before the worst of the major outbreak of this pandemic is happening in our community. So as we uh, focus this uh, uh, short program in this ever-changing world of, of COVID, uh, we really want to focus on the cardiac catheterization laboratory and, and some very uh, fundamental and important steps and try to share some of the interactions and results from the interactions we've had at our, our, with our colleagues around the world and also in the uh, Common Spirit uh, uh, program. So first of all, um, it seems uh, logical to really want to perform these procedures uh, safely uh, only in a designated uh, COVID-19 environment. Um, and that means a dedicated COVID uh, cath lab in the catheterization laboratory. Uh, in, the, in the case of uh, THI, all the uh, cath labs have uh, a positive uh, flow, and that is something that, uh, as it turns out, seems to be an, an acceptable uh, way to work. Of course, uh, keeping in mind, uh, the second point is that uh, we really need to be uh, extremely strict in uh, uh, using uh, and implementing PPE for uh, every single procedure. So what are the main things that we've done to prepare uh, the catheterization laboratory in terms of the COVID uh, situation. Well, first of all, we've gone, uh, this is an ever moving target and we really have gone from uh, doing some elective procedures and, and looking at guidelines that have come from SKY and from ACC and letters that have been put out and gradually reducing the volume of the elective procedures to we've gotten to a point where we really do not do elective procedures now and do what we call um, uh, tier two and, and tier one cases, which are uh, emergent or urgent uh, type cases that uh, the patient will impact the patient directly if, if they're not done. Uh, many times cardiology is, is, is an interesting specialty in that uh, it, it's quite fluid, it's difficult to predict certain outcomes. So we do the best that we can with common clinical sense uh, using our judgment uh, many times, there aren't uh, always cookbook answers to, to these questions. Uh, the, other, the other things uh, th then that we want to do is also uh, be mindful of the staffing of the cath lab. Who are the interventionalists that are going to be involved? And uh, with, with the primary idea of reducing the uh, staff that are uh, exposed. And, and there's three cardinal things that we always want to keep in mind. Number one, exposure of the patients. Number two, exposure of the staff. And number three, preservation of our uh, resources. Uh, Dr. Yunus uh, has uh, uh, done a really fantastic job in putting together uh, what I think are some really key questions uh, that I think uh, we can explore, uh, answer, 
and, and, and will sort of help us uh, encompass uh, our approach to uh, COVID uh, patients with acute, uh, urgent, or emergent cardiovascular issues that need to be addressed in the cardiac catheterization laboratory. So uh, the first question is this, and, and I'll let George answer it, is um, do we assume that all patients have COVID-19 until proven otherwise? Thank you, uh, Emerson. Thank you, Zvonko. Um, that is a very difficult question. And, uh, you know, certainly a lot of protocols that have been developed have, have looked at, well, you have patients that you know are high risk for COVID positivity. They may have a fever and cough, and those cases are easy. But we are knowing more and more that there are patients who can still disseminate the virus who have scant symptoms, if any. And so in an emergent situation where you're worried about a STEMI, the most prudent thing is probably to assume that the patient is COVID positive, positive. take all the necessary precautions for yourself and for your staff. Um, because aside from the human aspects of, of getting sick, if the more people are exposed, the more people get put on quarantine, and then you don't have enough staff to take care of other patients that may come through in the coming weeks. So I think, I think that's the most prudent thing to do. And, and I think an important point in that is that uh, testing is critical and the availability and the, 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 the rapidity of testing as it becomes available will have a major impact as yeah. we can quickly identify these patients uh, versus now when, when that kind of delays things. And we'll talk yeah. about Lord of Balloon time. We sure need that badly. We need rapid tests very, very soon. Um, Second question, we don't have a, a negative pressure cath lab, so, so what do we do with that, George? Well, as it turns out, very few, if any, centers do have negative pressure cath labs because like all operating suites, they're generated they're to be uh, positive pressure environments, not to draw in microbes in from the outside. But with the COVID patient, we don't want to be blowing any you know, aerosolized particles outward. Um, but unfortunately, turning a positive pressure room into a negative pressure room isn't just a flip of the switch thing. If you're lucky enough to have a window, apparently this may be an option. I mean, I'm not an engineer, but this is what I've heard. Um, the next best thing is to continue in your positive pressure environment, as we mentioned before, but maybe with the installation of a HEPA filter or other relevant filters to sort of do the best you can to filter out any microbes from being transmitted. Yes, yeah, we were we were recently on a webinar uh, with international and national centers, and and actually uh, it was interesting to see one of our colleagues in Chicago had uh, they had transformed one of their rooms uh, to have a HEPA filter in it, uh, and thought that was very interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's go to the next question. So, should cath lab staff wear full PPE for all cases? I think that is certainly the most prudent thing to do in the spirit of protecting everybody as much as possible. It does probably add time and some burden to the case for every technician, uh, you know, who's or scrub tech or every nurse to be in full PPE because that's not what we normally do. Um, but I think that is the most prudent course. Okay. And when, when, you know, now let's get into a little bit more when we're talking about these uh, urgent and emergent cases. We're really going to start talking a little bit about STEMI specifically because that's what we're dealing with. Um, and, and just as an aside, I think it was interesting that uh, many centers uh, 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 around the world and in the country have noticed an actual decrease in STEMI volume. It's, and, and that's maybe something that changes or that's temporary or we really don't know the explanation for. Maybe some of these patients are staying at home and we'll be seeing them later. Um, but nonetheless, uh, we haven't gotten the, the idea that uh, the cath labs are being inundated with these uh, acute cases, although there's some peculiarities that we need to talk about. So first of all, should, should stable or low risk patients be considered for thrombolysis? And if, and if so, where do you do the thrombolysis? And then how do you follow up on that? Yeah, very complex question. Um, but I think most centers are definitely considering use of thrombolysis, even in PCI capable centers, in particular patients who may be low risk. The use of thrombolytics upfront, if successful, uh, may obviate the need to go to the cath lab at any point. And uh, especially you know, if you have a patient who is highly suspicious for COVID, um, if you can keep that patient out of the cath lab, that that may be a great thing to do if, if there's uh, not much of a trade-off in terms of patient outcomes. So, you know, what is a low-risk STEMI patient? 
Um, the recent sky guidance sort of outlines several uh, features that may be relevant for that, but um, patients who are maybe a, a hemodynamically stable inferior MI, lateral MI, um, but anybody who's you know has hemodynamic instability would not really fit in that category. So I think thrombolytic devices should actually should absolutely be considered because of protect you know you may protect your staff and you may conserve people. Um, now, as to where it occurs, that's, that's a bit more complicated um, because if you're assuming these patients have come in through the ED, then probably it makes most sense for the patient to get thrombolytics in the ED. Um, most EDs have, have, have some comfort with this concept from taking care of stroke patients. And so hopefully my, you know, modifying existing protocols to allow thrombolysis to occur for STEMI patients um, would be sort of a lateral move in that regard. Um, there may be some centers, however, where they don't feel comfortable doing that and want the patient to be moved to, the, to an ICU. Um, but these things are probably institutionally based and, and need to be carefully thought out as part of your protocol. Um, and then the question becomes, well, what happens? If it's the thrombolysis is successful and the patient's doing fine, then you, know, you have some time to decide if you're gonna take the patient to the lab. And during that time, you can learn whether or not the patient is COVID positive. As it stands now, you're lucky if your center can get you results in a day. And so if the patient has successful thrombolysis, you monitor them in the COVID unit, you wait for the COVID results to come back, and then you know what's going on with the patient and you can decide, do we need to risk stratify this patient per further and take, uh, before taking them to the lab? Or do we just take them to the lab? Or, do we can, uh, or what do we do next? Now, if they're COVID positive, it becomes more complicated because there's the, you know, you, you may say, gosh, the sooner we can get this patient out of the hospital, the, the, the um, less risk there is to everybody else. And we follow up the coronary disease at a, at a later time frame. These are complex questions that are going to, of course, be very individualized, um, but they are very important. And, and I don't want to give our, our listeners also the, the idea, and I don't think that you've done this, but just to kind of reinforce the point, is that... Uh, what was your impression uh, in that how are most of the centers around the world and here in the U.S. Uh, dealing with STEMIs? Do, do, did you get the feeling that there's just this shift of thrombolysis or is there really continued uh, mainly direct PCI going on? Yeah, well, my impression even coming from the, the, the gentleman that we heard from in Italy was, was uh, that primary PCI was still the mainstay. Um, but I think a lot of people are, are looking at it as, well, as we lose, if, if the availability of PPE continues to go down and even the availability of healthy doctors and staff goes down, we may need to really look at thrombolytics in more patients. But I think currently, uh, outside of some papers that came from China, everybody else still seems to be favoring in, in practical time, practical work, uh, using primary PCI most of the time. Okay. And and then that takes us to an interesting question, which relates to uh, getting a clue. You know, some of these patients with COVID, uh, they, they have uh, myopericardial involvement and, and they may have really myocarditis with ST changes that look like a STEMI. And then what can you do to identify these patients? So should echo be used more often prior to deciding to go to the cath lab? And then how do you make that logistically uh, happen? How do you operationalize that? Right, so I, I think this is a really important and useful point. And even, even before that, you know, the history is even more important than ever. You know, it's, it, it, all SE elevations are not STEMIs. Um, you may have EKG changes in a patient who, you know, has a febrile illness, and that's a very different situation than an EKG change in someone with acute onset of chest pain. But you know, when you have a situation where you're not certain what's going on, but you do have ST changes, a real great way to help to understand that is to do a quick echo. And you know, if you have a uh, echo that shows wall motion abnormalities in the same distribution where you would expect them to be based on the EKG, then that supports that this may actually be a true, a true STEMI. Whereas if you see a perfectly normal appearing LV or you see sort of global wall motion, uh, you know, global mild hypokinesis in someone with like a inferior ST changes where it doesn't really add up, then that might tamper your enthusiasm to pursue it as a, as a STEMI and take the patient to the cath lab or certainly to get thrombolytics. Um, so I think echo can be a really useful adjunct. 
Um, and as to who would perform the echo, this is going to be very institutionally dependent. Academic centers like ours are, are fortunate to have capable fellows who carry around a portable echo machine and can come look at the patient uh, ultrasound by, by ultrasound real quick and tell us what's going on. Um, other centers may have to have uh, protocols involving either in-house staff or emergency room doctors who have uh, sufficient training to be able to really draw those conclusions. Okay, and so I'm gonna skip to question number seven before I go to number six, because it's kind of related. Uh, let's talk about CTA a little bit. How, how, how does that fit in? Can it help? What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think it's a, it's a, it's a very interesting idea in patients, cases where you don't really know what's going on. If you don't think, it, if you're not sure if it's a STEMI or not, even after you maybe done a quick look echo, uh, theoretically doing a CTA might be very beneficial to at least, you know, get a sense of certainly the proximal coronaries, let's say the heart rate, you know, has, of course has to be low enough to get a really good study, but, you know, in most patients, you can at least see the very proximal coronaries and see what's going on. Um, but the problem with doing a CTA is, of course, then you expose the CAT scan staff and the CAT scanner itself to potential, um, you know, exposure to the virus, and that needs to have a big clean afterwards. And another is availability. Um, I don't think most centers can do CTAs, good coronary CTA, 24-7. In most centers, and certainly at least in our center, the best trained staff for doing that are only available during daytime hours. So it becomes a little more complicated. Um, I think it's something that's probably evolving and may have its place, but it's a little bit hard to implement. So it really looks like ECHO's sort of the practical, quick way to see if an, a STEMI is really a STEMI, if, if you're in doubt about that. Huh? I think it's helpful, yeah. yeah. Um, so now let's shift gears a little bit and think about, uh, let's say we're taking a patient, we've decided he has a STEMI, we're taking him to the cath lab. Um, what about intubating that patient? Uh, what's our threshold for doing that, and, and what's the consensus on that? So there's, there's been a lot of discussion about perhaps having a lower threshold to intubate these patients prior to taking them to the cath lab. Um, I know in our center, intubations of uh, suspected COVID patients or emergent patients are only being done by anesthesia these days, as opposed to by ER staff or pulmonary or other people, in order to make sure that it's done in such a fashion as to minimize risk of aerosolized particles. And uh, if you have a patient with a STEMI, there's, this is a patient who is certainly at risk of decompensating in the next you know, 10 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour, and during the procedure. And if that patient crashes in the cath lab, you risk exposing the entire cath lab staff to aerosolized particles. Whereas uh, if you are more proactive and intubate people on the front end prior to bringing them up there, you, you know, now the respiratory um, circuit is, is closed already and you're not gonna have aerosoliz aerosolization of particles. And incidentally, if you, if you have done a coronary CTA before taking this patient to the cath lab, you'll also see the lung windows and you might have a clue as to what's going on if you start to see ground glass opacities on those patients, uh, which frequently look much worse on CAT scan than they do on x-ray or even clinically. You might also have a lower threshold to intubate that patient prior to bringing you in the cath lab for the safety of yourself, yourself and your staff. Okay, so... Where, where do we want to preferentially intubate these patients? Uh, um, do we do it in the emergency room? Do we do it in the ICU? Uh, well, I think, I, think in the, I think these patients who are STEMIs, they're in the ER, and then they, before they go to the cath lab, I would do it in the ER in most cases. Okay, so bringing up door to balloon time, and, I, and you know, uh, this whole COVID crisis puts it a little bit in perspective. Uh, you know, we're always so worried about NCDR metrics and this and that. Well, Right now, we're worrying about you know saving people's lives, and 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 it doesn't really matter uh, the door to balloon time in terms of the metrics, but it does matter in terms of patient outcomes, right? And if it takes an hour to let a room uh, uh, clean up and and the particles settle down, and then you have to do a terminal current clean, all, depending on your volume and how things go, uh, there are going to be delays in the system. And so what is this all going to do to our door-to-door -door balloon time and it's sort of in that perspective? Um, and, and how do we think about thrombolysis again? So I, I'm just kind of bringing up that point because it, it, it's important. Yeah, you know, I, I agree with your sentiments. You know, we, we spend so much time thinking and talking about metrics in normal times, and now it just seems so, so relatively silly to be talking about these other esoteric numbers when we're trying to just deliver care at this point. Um, 
But it's of course it's a relevant point, um, not only with the cleaning, but these ancillary tests we're talking about, um, like a CAT scan or an echo, or just getting the, the the PPE for the whole staff that takes additional time. You know, these are delays we're not accustomed to. And so, you know, if you can't get your door to balloon time in the acceptable manners anymore, then you know, if we're starting to treat patients two hours after they present. Well, maybe we would have been better off giving them thrombolysis if it was a stable patient because they would have received a chance at reperfusion right away. And so that's a very difficult question to tease out, and I think it's going to be answered as by each institution as they go forward taking care of these patients and see how much delay they are seeing prior to getting these patients into the cath lab. And if there appears to be a lot of delay, then, you know, again, the, the, the idea of giving thrombolytics in certain cases might be considered um, better just because there's a chance of reperfusion faster. Yeah, I think there's a lot of things that we don't know. Yeah. Um, the, our answer to some of these things may change over the next, even in, even in a week. Um, and, and, and as we get a more practical sense of these things, maybe we'll even go in a different direction. So um, the final question I want to ask you is uh, shifting gears from STEMI to NSTEMI. So what is the general feeling uh, regarding treatment of NSTEMI? Well, um, in the spirit of everything that's going on and protecting staff and conserving PPE, I think the general mood on this is to be more conservative. You know, I think we have generally had a pretty aggressive um, strategy towards these non-STEMI patients, but the truth is many of them can be treated medically um, for their NSTEMI and then only undergo catheterization if they have certain high risk features. Um, and so I think certainly a slow approach is best in these patients um, right now. And of course, if there's any instability, that's an easy one. But if they're, if they're very stable, uh, there may not be any good reason to take that patient to the cath lab right now. You could send them home, see how things go, and then reconsider. And, and I agree, and that's a message that I heard very clearly from our colleagues or from around the world and here in the US is really the, the shift uh, and, and I think this varies regionally as well, but you know, uh, the shift in uh, how we, we manage these patients and really, really only thinking about uh, an invasive strategy in people with, with ongoing ischemia who, who might be in trouble. Let me ask you a couple of questions that are also very pertinent and related to this topic. And uh, both of you can uh, answer them because I think they're important. One is, should we uh, dedicate COVID-specific uh, uh, cath lab for those COVID-positive patients? And uh, we at our institution have over 100 interventional cardiologists. Should we allow all of them to perform procedures to be exposed to a potential COVID-19 infection? Or should we uh, decide that, that uh, we'll have a dedicated team that will be doing those procedures to avoid excessive use of PPEs and also exposure to many of our interventionalists. So maybe each of you can address this uh, question. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll just start with the, the, the personnel issue. Um, again, the, the practice patterns really vary around the country. Um, you know, at Texas Heart, we still have uh, uh, group, private practice groups. And, and one of the interesting things that I've seen is uh, some of the groups uh, dividing their, their you, know, you know, groups that have, you know, let's say six doctors, dividing them into the interventionalists into teams where some of them are off or not in the hospital for, for a period of time and they really alternate when they come in. But I think it's really going to vary a lot with the, 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 the practice patterns locally at different places. So the reason that I was asking this question because in other countries where there is socialist medicine, they're basically uh, limiting the number of interventionists that are doing the procedure. That is true in a lot of European countries. And if we uh, get a severe, a severe increase in number of the cases, we might have to consider something of that kind also here in the United States. George, any other comments related to this? Well, I, th I think that's, that's um, as Emerson said, that I think it's uh, something that's going to be really institution dependent. I've heard um, of different proposals that are from different countries, I mean, different uh, institutions here in the U.S. 
Um, and some are doing just what Emerson was talking about um, amongst themselves is the staggering staffing of the cat lab from a physician standpoint. Um, there was also a discussion on our call last night about whether physicians over 60 should be excused from doing cases for the time being. And of course, it's going to depend on, well, how many people does, is, is, does that leave you? Does that leave you only one guy or, you know, do you have a bunch of young guys? So there's a lot of uh, things to think about um, in, in this regard and trying to keep everybody safe. Well, thank you very much. If you don't have any other questions, I would like to thank uh, to you, Emerson, and to George for um, your very valuable contribution to this Texas Art Institute program on the cardiac cath lab and stemming in the era of COVID-19. Thank you very much for your participation. It's a pleasure to work with you on our educational programs. For those of you that have tuned in to this program, please join us for our next program on cardiology in the time of COVID-19. Stay healthy and treat your patients.